Welcome to Amity Christian Church. We're uh, glad that uh, you guys are here with us this morning. And uh, this morning, I am, I am feeling especially humbled. Um, and you may think, oh, Lee, why is that? Well, it's not as for a serious reason as you may think. Um, so, uh, a while back, uh, Cody and I um, made a little wager with Jim. And if you know anything about me and Cody... We are Dallas Cowboys fans. And if you know anything about Jim, he is an avid Seattle Seahawks fan. And a while back, uh, we made a bet before the season started, uh, because we knew the Cowboys and Seahawks were going to play each other. We made a bet that if the Cowboys won, then Jim would have to walk around in a Cowboy shirt. And if the Seahawks won, Cody and I would have to walk around in a Seahawks shirt. So the game was this past Sunday. And of course, like they always do, the Cowboys let me down and they lost. So um, I now have to wear a Seahawks shirt in Jim's presence. So that is why I'm feeling humbled this morning. And I personally, I believe the only reason the Seahawks won was so that uh, was to humble me because this morning I'm speaking about humility. And that way I could be a better preacher for you this morning. So I think it's the only reason that God let the Seahawks win. So um, on to our subject of humility. We're going to be examining two parables in the book of Luke. If you remember, our series is we are in the parables of Jesus. And these two parables on the surface may seem somewhat unrelated, but uh, they, do, they do connect. So, the first parable is in Luke chapter 14. And we're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11. But before, before, we, get, before we get to that, I kind of want to give you some context. So, um, in the beginning of chapter 14, uh, Jesus is eating in the house. It says he's eating in the house of a prominent Pharisee. Um, and he's having a Sabbath meal. That was a pretty... A traditional meal for, for the Jews to have was um, on the Sabbath they would have a meal uh, together. And when it says he's eating in the house of a prominent Pharisee, it doesn't just mean that he's eating like alone with this Pharisee, but he's probably surrounded with a bunch of other Pharisees as well. Because in that, in that culture, when you would have a meal like that that had significance, you would invite people who were of same status as you were. So a Pharisee was going to invite a Pharisee. Um, he wasn't going to invite anyone of any lower status, because then that would say something about his status, that it was lower than he actually wanted to project. He wanted to project, uh, you wanted to project a certain status. And so that's why the Pharisee invites all these other Pharisees. And so Jesus is a part of this meal, and he notices that's going on, but he notices there's something else going on. If you look at verse 7 of Luke 14, it says, When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. So Jesus notices what's going on here is the Pharisees at this meal, when, they, when, they, when they're coming in to eat, they're looking for the place of honor at the table. They're looking for the places of honor. Now what that meant was, um, large, most likely what's going on here is the, the meal was set up with, there was, the seating was, there was cushions on the ground kind of in the shape of a U. And the host would sit at the very base of the U. And he was, you know, he was the the, the most honorable one because he was hosting the meal. And so what these people are doing is they're fighting for a seat closest to the host because that, in that you receive the most amount of honor, most amount of recognition. And so that's what these people are jockeying for. It's what these people are, are fighting for. And Jesus, Jesus notices that this is going on. And this is not the first time that he's, he's addressed this issue with the Pharisees. Because if you go back to Luke 11, Jesus when Jesus is giving the woes to the Pharisees, he says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you pick the best places to sit in the synagogues. So Jesus notices this is going on again, and in order to address the issue, he tells them a parable. If you look at verse 8, he says, When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may be invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when, you, when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, 
and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, when I, when I read this parable, it kind of makes me think of Thanksgiving in my, my family growing up. If, uh, I don't know if your Thanksgivings were like this, but in my Thanksgiving meals, there was always an adult table, and then there was a kid's table. And if you were be- in my family, if you were below 18 years old, you didn't dare try and sit at the adult table. Because if you did, you'd be shamed back to the kid's table. Now, I probably ate at the kid's table until I was about like 20 years old, and I probably still really haven't sat at the adult table. It's been like maybe once in my life that I've actually sat there. Um, but Jesus here, I think what he's, what he's doing is he's tapping into a very important ideal in the culture. Um, because the culture that he's in is a, an honor-shame culture. That in that culture, what you pursue is the greatest honor for yourself and for your family and, you know, and to avoid shame at all costs. So you, you were to do anything you can to gain honor for yourself and your family and do anything you can to avoid being shamed. That's, what, that's just what you did. And so Jesus here notices that's going on. And in this parable, he totally reverses this ideal. He says... You may think that seeking honor from from others and and seeking the best seat at the table is what's going to get you honor, but that's actually going to bring you shame. He says that's what you're going to be humiliated because you're going to be put in the least important place. Instead, he says what you should be doing is seeking the lowest seat at the table, and by that you will then receive honor and you will be brought up to a better place. So essentially what he's saying here is He's not saying seek honor and avoid shame. What he's saying is seek humility and then receive honor as a result. And this idea that Jesus is presenting here, which is totally countercultural to them, was something that's actually already been played out in the book of Luke. If you go back to the, the story of the birth of Jesus and when uh, Gabriel appears to Mary and says, you're going to have a son and he's going to be named Jesus, she could have been like, no, actually, I don't want that to happen to me. That's too weird. And, but instead she, says, instead she says, no, let it be done as you have said. And so uh, and then later on in Luke chapter 1, whenever Mary sings her song of praise, she says, Lord, you took me from being a lowly servant and you exalted me to a higher place to be the mother of Jesus. And then if you go just a couple of chapters back, Jesus again is eating in the house of a prominent uh, Pharisee, and and a woman comes, which, you know, again, being being meals were of you know, of meals were meals were uh, communicated status, and this woman came. That would have been just totally wrong. She but she comes. She kneels at Jesus's feet, which again the Pharisees would have had an issue with. So she kneels at Jesus's feet, and then she starts weeping. She starts weeping on Jesus's feet, and then she takes her hair and starts wiping Jesus's feet with her hair. And so that's, you know, Pharisees are like, what, what in the world is wrong with this woman? And then, and then not only does she do that, but she, she then takes a jar of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet. So the Pharisees by this point are just totally, like, weirded out by what's going on. Like, why is she doing this? But then Jesus is like, listen, because of what she did, because she humbled herself before me, she's going to be forgiven of her sins. Because the text calls her a sinful woman. But Jesus says, because of she humbled herself before me, she is going to receive forgiveness. Her status was exalted. But not only is Jesus saying, seek humility and receive honor, what is he saying is, if you seek honor from others, you yourself are going to be humbled. That's what he says in verse 11, for those who exalt themselves are going to be humbled. And this idea has also already been played out in Luke. If you go back to chapter 11, when Jesus is giving the woes to the Pharisees, I mean, over and over again, he's humbling them. He's saying, woe to you, Pharisees, just because you think, just because you offer, you know, the smallest of your herbs and, your, and the mint you have and all of that, just because you offer that, you think you're righteous? Actually, you're not, because you're neglecting justice in the process. Pharisees, you think you're righteous because you have the best place in the synagogues? No, actually, you're not. And he says, woe to you, Pharisees, because you... Uh, you give burdens to people that they couldn't possibly carry. And you're going to be judged as a result of that. So these two ideas have already been played out in Luke. That Jesus is saying, seek humility and receive honor. 
take the lowest seat and you will be brought to a better seat. But if you consistently seek honor from others, you will be consistently humbled. If you, take the, you try to take the highest place, you will be brought to the lowest place. And Jesus, when he's talking about this exaltation and humiliation in verse 11, he doesn't necessarily say who's doing the exalting, who's doing the humbling. But very clearly, he's talking about God who's doing this. Because this language that Jesus is, is saying this in is not new to them. And this was always said in context of, of, God, of God judging. If you go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 17, um, we see an example of this. Ezekiel 17 verse uh, 24. That now here, Ezekiel is himself t- telling a parable about how Israel is going to be judged and then sent into captivity. And he says in verse 24, All the trees of the forest will know that I, the Lord, bring down the tall tree and make the low tree grow tall. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do it. And then we have this language again in Proverbs chapter 3. Starting in verse 33, it says, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The wise inherit honor, but fools get only shame. So Jesus here is not just talking about, you know, if you exalt yourself in some sort of way in your life, God's going to humble you. What he says is, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about God's judgment. That this is not just true for life, but this is true in eternity as well. That if in this life you consistently seek honor from others, God, in the end, will humble you permanently. But in this life, if you seek humility, if you seek the lowest seat at the table, you will be exalted permanently. And this this is also evident, this idea is also evident by the way that the Pharisees respond to this, uh, to this, what, the, this parable. If you go down just a couple verses later in verse uh, 15, the Pharisee sitting there hears Jesus say this, and he says, he says, Blessed is the one who takes part in the feast of the kingdom of God. Now, why that points to, why that points to eternity is if you go to Revelation 19, it describes that when Jesus comes back, and, he, and when we're in heaven, it describes that we are going to take part in the wedding feast of the Lamb. And, and so this Pharisee, these Pharisees understand what Jesus is talking about has eternal significance. And so what he's saying here is this whole idea about seeking humility, it affects us, it affects us eternally. So it begs the question, are we pursuing humility? Are we pursuing that in our lives, or are we consistently pursuing the honor and approval of others? And this may be an idea you, you, you've heard a lot. They you know God doesn't want us to seek approval of others, but seek his approval. That, 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 that's, that's what he wants. And, and we almost brush this off as if, it's a minor, as if it's a minor issue. Well, it's not a big deal. You know, it's just something I struggle with, but, you know, it's fine. But that's not what Jesus says here. Jesus is saying this is a major issue issue that needs to be dealt with because it has eternal consequences. So then the question is, okay, what does this kind of humility look like? How do I get to a place where I consistently seek out the lowest seat at the table? How do I have that kind of humility? Well, I think we get the answer for that in the next parable. If you go and flip over to Luke 18 uh, in verses uh, 9 through 14, Jesus says this, uh, To some of you, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down at everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even... Look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
Now, Luke doesn't say explicitly who he's talking about. He doesn't say Jesus is necessarily talking to Pharisees, or he's talking to Jews, or he's talking to the disciples. He doesn't necessarily say who he's talking to, but if you think about it for a couple of seconds, you can figure it out. Jesus is clearly talking about the Pharisees. He's clearly talking to the Pharisees. Because if you go back just a couple of chapters before in verse, uh, verse chapter 16, verse 15, it says, he's talking to the Pharisees. He says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others. But God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. And then, not, if that's not enough evidence for you, Jesus then, one of the characters in the parable is a Pharisee who is in the wrong. And so Jesus is clearly addressing this issue again. You know, he, he talks about, he's, you know, he's talking about people who, who, who think they're righteous, but by, do, by thinking that they're righteous, they've, 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 um, they've made everyone else inferior to them. And if you remember the la- what happened after the last parable, the, the Pharisee who came to him and said, uh, blessed is the one who takes part in the kingdom of God. Not only is he recognizing the statement of Jesus as having eternal consequences, but what he's also doing is he's thinking that he is going to take part in the wedding feast. He's going to take part in the feast of the kingdom of God. He's thinking that he is righteous. But if you read the rest of the, the, the parable, the parable of the great banquet, Jesus says, because of what's going on here, because of how this has all t- gone down, you are actually going to be excluded from the kingdom of God because of the way in which this has happened, because of your heart. And so Jesus, again, is confronting the same issue here. And so he, said, he, he sets up the parable by, by propping up two characters, the Pharisee and the tax collector. And it says that both of them went up to the temple. Now, when we read this parable, we probably have thought of it in a way of, of these two guys are going to have some sort of private devotion. But I don't think that's really what's going on here because Jews in, th- in that time would go to the temple twice a day for, for corporate worship. And what would go on is, is they would go to the temple, the priest would go in, offer incense, they would see the incense going up out of the temple, and then they would offer prayers as a result of that. And so it says these two guys are here, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and it says the Pharisee stood by himself. Now that's an important detail to notice because what's most likely going on is the Pharisee is stepping away from the crowd and he's making a statement about his status. He's separating himself saying, I'm better than everyone that's here right now. I'm a Pharisee, I'm a teacher of religious law, I, I follow the law well, so I, I'm better than these people, so I'm separate from them. And that's evident by what he says next. He goes, God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people, the evildoers, the robbers, even this tax collector. So he like even points out the guy who's standing right next to him, which, I mean, that's not cool, dude, <laughs> to do that. And so he, <clears throat> he does this, and then at this point in the parable, the people hearing this are largely thinking, okay, there's nothing wrong with what this guy's doing. Like, it's a Pharisee. Clearly, he's better than a, ta- a tax collector and an, adul- an adulterer and a-, and a sinner. Of course, he's better than that. So Jesus is almost like setting this guy up as, as you know, as, as a good Pharisee. And so not only does the, and next, not only does the Pharisee separate himself physically, but he sets, separates himself spiritually. He says, he says, listen, I, I fast twice, you know, I fast twice a week. But if you know the law, Jews were only required to fast once a year on the Day of Atonement. That's all they were required to fast. So why is this Pharisee going above and beyond what the law requires? Well, Pharisees, what they would do is, over time, they, you know, they took the law and then they adapted the law to their own, to their own time. And so, and so uh, somewhere along the line, it got to the point where Pharisees were required to fast you know, twice a week. And so he's, you know, he's going above and beyond what the law actually says. And people are thinking, okay, that's, that's fine. And so not only does he fast twice a week, but he says he gets a tenth, uh, uh, he gives a tenth of all that he gets, you know, of everything that he gets. Now, again, the law says that you're only required a tenth of what your fields produced. So he's, again, going above and beyond what the law actually says. And so again, they're thinking, people here are thinking, there's nothing wrong with this guy. He's, he's following the law. He's going to, 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 to the temple to pray. 
Seems kind of just like standard operating procedure for this guy. But it's not, you know, if you go back to, again, go back to Luke 11, which we've talked about a couple of times already. Jesus confronts the Pharisees directly about this, especially about this tithing issue. He says, Woe to you, Pharisees, and just because you think you, you are righteous because you give your mints and your herbs and even the tiniest little thing that you're going to be righteous, no, actually, you're neglecting justice as a result of that. Jesus understood that the reason the Pharisees did this was not to be you know, law-abiding, was, but was, that, was to prop themselves up above everybody else, that they wanted to be better than everybody else. And not only that, but then they placed these, you know, un... They placed these incredible burdens on people that they couldn't possibly live up to. And then that would even prop themselves up even more. So Jesus understands that that is exactly what's going on here. And it's clear that that is what's going on here in this parable. Now the Pharisee mentions God, but he kind of mentions him in passing. You know, he says, God, I just want to, essentially he says, God, I just want to make sure that you know how good I am. I want you to make sure you know, that you know how righteous I am. That, you know, I, I follow the law perfectly. I'm the greatest Pharisee to have ever lived. You know, I am, I am just that good. So he just wanted to make sure God understood just how, just how good he actually was. And at this point, again, I would imagine the people hearing this would be like, okay, this Pharisee seems like, like pretty standard Pharisee. What's wrong with him? And so Jesus then turns to the tax collector who, because Jesus has propped this, uh, seemed to them as Fer Jesus has propped up this Pharisee so much that Jesus is about to destroy this tax collector. He's about to scold this guy because that's what they believed that tax collectors deserved. They were the lowest of the low, scum of the earth. You know, they were betrayers because they collected taxes for the Roman government. Like they were just the worst people you could possibly imagine. So that's what that's what they deserve. So that's what he's probably going to get in their minds. But Jesus doesn't, that's not what takes place. So if you notice, the tax collector, just like the Pharisee, also stands at a distance. But he stands at a distance for a different reason. It says that he doesn't even look to heaven. Which would have been weird because the proper posture of prayer in that time was to look to heaven to God. So people are thinking, okay, what's, what's, what's the issue with this guy? And then it says that he beats his breast. Now that would be in a sign of extreme sorrow. And the reason that that would have been strange to them is because this would often take place at, like, at funerals. And not only that, but when that happened at funerals, it was mostly women who did that. So it's a man doing this. And so they're thinking, what is wrong with this guy? What is, what is he doing? And then he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And now when he says a sinner, the Greek actually has a definite article before sinner. So he's not saying a sinner, he's saying the sinner. That he is the chief of sinners. He is the worst of sinners. And then when he says, have mercy on me, the word that's actually used there is, is more properly understood as atonement, as God taking away sins. So he's saying, God, have mercy. God, take away my sin. God, I am the sinner. Take away my sins. And if you remember, they're in the temple where the Jews would go to have atonement for their sins. The priests would go and offer sacrifices and the Jews would then receive atonement. Their sins would be covered. But remember, this tax collector has already separated himself from the group. He separated himself from the people who are there. Clearly saying, I don't, like, the, the, these sacrifices, like, I don't even deserve, I don't deserve them. They're not going to cover the immensity of my sin. They're not, they're, they just, they just can't. Only God can do that. You know, and he, and he, and he and it says he, he doesn't even look up to heaven because he's so, he's so ashamed of the gravity of his sin. And that's why he beats his breast, because he's so overwhelmed with it. He's saying, only, only God is going to be able to cover my sin. And this may be Jesus subtly saying that the sacrifices offered in the temple can't cover 
this guy's sin, and they can't cover anybody's sin. And so at this point, most people hearing this would have agreed that this tax collector was the sinner, that he was the worst of all sinners, he was a terrible person. And they're thinking, yeah, you are the sinner, that's right. But then when he says, God have mercy on me, they're thinking, ha ha, good luck with that one, buddy. That's not going to happen. God is not going to have mercy on a terrible person like you. But Jesus, as he often does, flips the script and says, actually, this tax collector is more justified than the Pharisee. Or maybe more rightly translated, he is more righteous than the Pharisee. You notice what Jesus is doing here. If you remember how Luke set up the parable, Jesus is talking to people who believe they are righteous, but they actually are not. So Jesus here is saying, listen, the, the Pharisee who, who bragged about how good he was, and, and you think he is righteous because of how, how good he thinks he is, actually, he is not justified before God. He is not righteous before God. But the, but the tax collector who humbled himself, realized who he was in relation to God, he is the one who's going to go home justified. He is going to be the one to go home exalted. Because he humbled himself before God. And that's why then Jesus says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's the same exact verse in Luke 14. And both of them are in the context of judgment. Jesus here, in these parables, he's not, just, he's not just giving us moral lessons about how we should live. He's, he's saying that the kingdom that I'm bringing in, the kingdom that I'm ushering in, is supposed to radically change how things work. That those who, that those who humble themselves before me will actually be made righteous. And those who think they are good because they follow the law, but don't, but don't, don't, Think the, but, but, and think they're righteous because of that, they are actually going to be humbled as a result. So, back to our question before we examine this parable. How do we get to a place of consistent humility in our lives? How do we get to the place that this tax collector got to? The place where we, where we consistently take the lowest seat at the table? Well, I think the answer lies in when we have the right perspective of who we are in relation to God. That just like this tax collector, he understood that he was never going to be righteous without God. He was never going to be good enough without God. That he wasn't going to be anything without God. That is the perspective that we have to have about ourselves. That in and of ourselves, we are not righteous. In and of ourselves, we are not good enough. It is only through God that we are made righteous and we have worth. It takes a constant reliance on His mercy. That's why the book of Lamentations says that His mercy is new every single day because we have to constantly rely on it. And when we have that perspective, that will allow us to never view anybody as inferior to us. Because that was the issue with the, whole, the Pharisees in the first place. is because of their righteousness, they viewed other people as less than them. But when we have this view of, of ourselves in relation to God that we are not good without Him, this will never allow for that. We will never believe someone is, is, is less than we are. And in fact, having this humility will allow us not to just have the view of not you know, people not being inferior to us, but will actually allow us to, to elevate their value, that we will value them above ourselves, as Paul says in Philippians 2. Because when you, when, when you humble yourself before God and realize that, that, that you are a sinner in need of His grace and in need of His mercy, and God comes in and forgives you, and you think, I mean, if God can forgive someone like me, He can forgive anyone. And that immediately elevates their status and immediately elevates their value in your eyes. Because you see that God can save them. And all of this, 
This is all possible because of the example that Jesus set. This being being exalted in, in humility is possible because of Jesus. If you go to Philippians chapter 2, and this is a verse that, this is a section that I am sure you've heard, but it's always worth reading. If you go to Philippians 2, starting in verse 5, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not cons- consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." As we know, Jesus had every reason to be superior. He was with God in heaven. Everything was perfect. He could have looked down on us on earth and been like, I don't want to enter that mess. I don't want to have to deal with those sinners. I'm, I'm good where I am. But it says he, he, didn't, he didn't use his position for his own advantage, but he said he humbled himself to be a human. So he took himself from being with God to being a human, And then not only did he do that, but he says in his humanity, he became a servant. He became a slave, lowering his status even more. But then not only that, in his his, uh, status as a slave, he died on a cross, which would have been the most humiliating death you could possibly imagine in that time. So Jesus went from the highest high to the lowest low, the greatest humiliation anyone has ever faced. But then it says, because of that, because he humbled himself to the cross, we are able to to, to receive grace and, and receive mercy. And because of that, it says he was exalted to the right hand of God. Jesus is the forerunner of being of humbling himself and being exalted. And because of that, that is possible for us as well. So the, the answer to, to the question, how do we get to a place of consistent humility? is through emulating the one who set the precedent in the first place, who made it all possible for us to begin with. And so, in our lives, if we show this consistent humility, if we serve others in the way that Jesus did and humble ourselves in the way that Jesus did, we will be exalted like him. And one day, when, the, when, the, when this life is through and we get to take part in the, the wedding feast of the Lamb, because we've consistently humbled ourselves in this life, we will take our seat in his presence. Let's pray. God, we uh, come to you and um, God, we are, we are humbled um, in your presence and we um, know and understand that without you, God, we uh, cannot be made righteous. Without you, um, we, are, we are nothing. But with you, you, you elevate our status. You elevate um, our value. And God, I pray that in our lives we can consistently show that kind of humility, not just with you, but in our relationships with others. God, have mercy on us sinners. Amen.